Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the Bible study we are having today. We praise your name because of the revelations you've been giving us. And we thank you because we believe that you are going to reveal more of yourself to us even today in Jesus' name. We pray that these things that you are telling us and teaching us now will help us and guide us in life so that the things we ought to do that will make life satisfactory and fulfilling will be able to accomplish them effectively in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We're still on the series we're dealing with, Marriage for Singles. Again, let me remind you that though we're particularly addressing the messages to singles who are praying to know the will of God, the principles we're getting out of the Word of God apply to all people. Last week, I dealt with the first part of spiritual guidance. And I showed you that very often in our lives, we are faced with the necessity of making a choice, taking a decision on different areas of life, maybe on the choice of career, maybe on the choice of business partners, maybe it is taking or leaving an employment, or perhaps employing some helpers at home, or employing new hands at work. Who knows, you might even eventually come to the position of choosing workers in the church or a church. Or it may be that you are strengthening new relationships and breaking old relationships. Whichever case it may be, we are always and constantly faced with the possibility and the necessity of taking decisions. And the outcome of those decisions to take will affect your life now and hereafter. Though we're talking about knowing the will of God in marriage, the principles we're establishing from the Word of God will apply to various areas of making a choice, taking a decision, knowing the will of God, knowing what direction to follow in life. I must tell you this, that there are some Christians who think that it is no longer easy to know the will of God as the saints of old knew the will of God. In fact, some ministers themselves, they do not know how to direct members of the church on knowing the will of God because something is missing in their own lives. They do not know how they came into the ministry. You know, that's a major decision also, to begin to preach the gospel, accept the call of God upon your life, know the will of God for your life, and begin to preach and teach. And if you know how you came into that, it will be easy for you also to teach and to know the ways other people will be directed in knowing the will of God. But whatever confusion remains in the hearts of many people, we need to understand that God has promised today that he will guide his own. Look at Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct thee, and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. That is the unchanging promise of the Lord. And as he has given that promise, believers need to put their faith in the Lord, that according to his promise, he will guide. You see, you cannot begin to think about the methods of guidance without building on the foundation that God will guide. If you have any doubt, if you are in a state of unbelief, saying, I do not know whether God will guide or not. Whatever methods of guidance you know, you will not be able to rely upon those methods because you have doubt within you, whether God will guide or whether he will not guide. But when you understand that God will lead you, God will guide you, then you understand that you can depend upon the Lord. You can find out from the scriptures what the methods are. When we teach children in particular, we tell them they ought to pray. And they ought to pray about great blessings and little, little blessings. We can bring that to adults as well. And we can tell ourselves that we ought to seek the will of God in major issues of life and in small matters in life. 
In fact, when you test out the principles of guidance in little, little things in life, when it comes to major decisions of life, you'll be able to know how to get guidance from the Lord. Psalm 16, reading from verse 7. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I, said, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. The principle we're getting from here is that you have the conviction and the belief within you that the Lord will definitely give you counsel. And therefore, even before you know the methods of guidance, you are blessing the Lord, you are rejoicing in the Lord. It is in the midst of that confident joy. It's in the midst of that blessed assurance filled with peace in the heart with the expectation that the guidance of the Lord will come to you, that eventually God will guide you. And then the psalmist said, My reins, my heart, my internal inward parts also shall instruct me in the night season. I'll come to that later. How God guides, how he uses your own heart, your own spirit to write upon. Well, you know, when the teacher is teaching a, a little boy or a little girl, sometimes the teacher will use the pupil's hand, the pupil's pencil, the pupil's paper to write on so that the child will be able to see. Oh, so that is how that letter is written. So that is how that number or figure is written. So that is how that thing can be drawn. And many times God will use your own heart, speak in your own spirit so that you'll be able to tell the guidance of the Lord. In John, still to make you have assurance that God will definitely guide and lead his own. John chapter 10, from verse 3. To him the potter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own by name, and leadeth them out. He calleth his own by name. It is not just that God will guide the church in general, that God will guide the congregation in general, but that God will specifically lead individually, name by name, from person to person, he will guide his own. He calleth his own by name, and he leadeth them out in the direction, in the way they ought to go. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and his sheep follow him, for they know his voice. They know his voice. That's one of the ways that he guides. We'll talk much about that later. In John chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. The point I want to remind you of here is that many of us who are Christians always say, if I had been alive when Jesus was alive, there will be no difficulty for me. Why was I born at a time like this? You know, if I had been born at a time when Jesus went through Galilee and Capernaum and grew up in Nazareth, if I wanted to get married, it will not take me hours and minutes, it will not take me months and weeks, neither will it take me years to pray. I just go straight ahead to Jesus and I say, now Lord, here it is, I want to get married. What's his name? What's her address? And I just take notes as you are telling me, and five minutes, it will be over. But you know, you say, it's unfortunate I am born at this time, because now I cannot see him. But you know, Jesus said, even if you were in the world at that time, there are a lot of things he wouldn't have told you. There are a lot of things he wouldn't have guided you in the physical, in the natural. He will still relate everything to the spiritual. And that even if you were alive at that time, you will still have to depend upon faith. You know, we're always going back to walking by sight. If I could have handled him and seen him and talked to him face to face, he would just have guided me. I would just have said, now, Lord Jesus, I want to take a new appointment. Should I go? Yes or no? And then I get the answer, and that is all. 
I want to pack to this new apartment. Is it all right? Is it not all right? And he would just have said yes or no. And I think that I now am ripe enough for marriage. Who am I getting married to? So and so or such and such. But Jesus said, even if you were around at that time, there are many things I would have told you, but you cannot bear them now. Then he said in verse 13, How be it, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. Those apostles and disciples were guided by the Lord Jesus Christ in the natural, in the physical, just about three and a half years. And for the rest of their lives, more than 10 years, more than 20 years, they needed to depend upon the same method of guidance that we are teaching today, that we are learning today. And so, feel convenient. Even if you are around at that time, you still need to know all these methods we'll be talking about just now. The point is this. Christ promised that he will guide his own. And he's fulfilling that promise even today. The ability to follow the leading of God in major and important decisions in life that frequently arise in our lives will make your life satisfactory and fulfilling. But, on the other hand, if you have the inability to discern or to know the will of God in marriage and in other personal and family matters, that will make your life miserable and eternally painful. One point is this. We tell the woman, you have to eat the food you cook. And we tell every believer, you will live with the decisions you are taking. Whether those decisions are good or bad, you are going to live with them. You get married. Whether that decision is good or bad, one thing is sure, you are living with that decision you are taking for the rest of your life. And so you might as well find out, how do I know the will of God? How will I be guided in life? Many Christians have not been sufficiently clear on how to discern the will of God and the leading of God in life. This ignorance affects marriage, affects service, and other important issues of eternal consequences in their lives. The confusion arises from the lack of teaching, or perhaps from prayerlessness, or perhaps from lack of meditation on God's word and God's ways. Do you know, believer, that there are times that you just sit down and you just capture some incidents or instances in the Bible. Just meditate on those ways, on those events. And God will be teaching you that that is how he acts. Some people say that God works mysteriously. But then he has given us his spirit to untie the knot, to reveal the mystery to explain the difficulty. And if you'll spend time in meditation, thinking upon the Word of God, you'll discover in your life that you'll be able to understand how God guides. Again, I want to emphasize to you before I go to these instances of spiritual guidance, that it is not only in marriage that we seek guidance from the Lord. In fact, after your marriage, you just begin to find out areas of guidance in your life. Many, many things you'll need to take decisions upon after you have got married. So after you have married, you cannot say, thank God now I've settled. Thank God now I got my husband. Thank God now I got my wife. So I do not have to pray anymore to know the will of God in any other area. Life has just begun. And there are still important areas you need to know the will of God. Look at Psalm 73. Verses 16 and 17. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. The person who wrote this psalm became confused in life. There were a lot of unanswered questions, untied knots, unresolved difficulties, unsolvable, so to say, problems in his life. And he thought to know about it, it was painful, it was confusing. He was walking in the dark until he got to the sanctuary of God. And then the whole thing was revealed unto him. Many times in your life you'll find that. That there are some questions that you cannot answer. Some problems you cannot solve. Some mountains that you cannot climb. And some knots you cannot untie. Until you come to the sanctuary of God and he reveals everything to you. Then your mind is filled with assurance and peace. 
what I'm saying is this. Even after your marriage or before your marriage, there are other areas of life you need to take decisions upon. Therefore, you need to learn how to know the will of God. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. Let me just throw this in at this time. There are people that go by the rule of expediency. What does that mean? Whenever they want to do anything, they ask themselves simple questions. Which way is easier? Which way is nearer? Which path is shorter? Which one is more convenient? Which one will cost me less money? Which one will take less time? And whichever one is nearer or closer, or the one that is more convenient, or the one that will take less time, or the one that will take less money, oh, they say that's the right way. But that's not always the right way. You see here, the word of God says that God did not lead the children of Israel through the way of the Philistines, although that was near. It's not always by the rule of expediency that you will work. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up and nest out of the land of Egypt. So we need, we need to know how to be led by God. Because I read to you last week, there are ways that appear or seem unto men to be proper, to be right. But the ends thereof are the ways of death. Those ways that you think this is nearer, this will cost me less time, less money, less effort, less energy. And this will be more convenient, obviously. That may not be the way the Lord wants you to take. You must pray and know the guidance, the leading of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 23, 1 Samuel chapter 23 from verse 1. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite the Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines, and save Keilah. Now, if David did not know the way of the Lord, the leading of the Lord in his life, not only in marriage, but in his life in general, that man would have been crushed and destroyed a long time before he died. Because he had many difficulties. He had many confusing situations in life. He needed guidance. He needed the leading of the Lord. And aren't we like that? Many detours in life, many areas in life that we just do not know how to know our way. And a signboard on the road of life is not always clear. And therefore we need to know from the Lord, O oh Lord, which way do I take? Which path will I take? And eventually he even helped the people of Keilah. And eventually Saul heard that David was there. Look at verse 8. And Saul called all the people together to war, to go down to Keilah to beseech David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar, the priest, bring hither the effort. And then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant has certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant has heard? O Lord God, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. What if David only knew the will of God for marriage and he did not know the will of God on other important areas of life? I told you, he would have died long ago. What if you only learn about knowing the will of God in marriage, but you are blank, you are ignorant, you are confused, you walk in darkness, or in all other areas of your life, life will not be fulfilling. Life might be cut short. Life may not be able to fulfill the plan and the goal of, of life. And therefore you need to know the will of God. In verse 11, will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down? Verse 12, then David 
Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee all. He had helped them, he had saved them from destruction. And yet the Lord said that he will be delivered. So we need to know the will of God for our lives. And today, I want to start. I will just start. I cannot finish it up today. Because if you look at the outline, page 1 and page 2, it's full. And if I just run through, it's easy for me to read all the references and all the notes there and say, that is it, those are the notes, let's rise up and pray. And you'll say, I didn't understand that. We finished everything on the outline, but I still, I'm still confused. So we're not going to be in a hurry. Is that all right? I said, is that all right? We're going to go step by step. If I don't finish today, well, if Jesus tarries next Monday, I will finish up. If Jesus doesn't tarry and he comes before next Monday, you don't need the rest of the outline. Because after the rapture and we get to heaven, we'll know everything that we ought to know. No more Bible study after we get to heaven. We just know everything that we ought to know. But if he doesn't come before next Monday, you will need the rest of the outline, so I will still teach you. I think that will be all right. Now we're going to look at instances of spiritual guidance in the Word of God. Instances of spiritual guidance. How does God guide? How does He lead? We've seen a lot of people in Bible days, and they have said, God led them. I read about David to you now. I read about the whole congregation of the children of Israel to you. And a lot of other people I could have read to you about, and will still read about. How did they know the guidance of the Lord? That's what we're looking at. There are seven instances I have written down on the outline. Number one, the voice of the indwelling Christ. The voice of the indwelling Christ. Let me remind you again. You need to have faith in Christ. Faith in God. Believing that He will speak to you. Believing that He will guide you. He will not leave you in the wilderness. He will not leave you in darkness. He will not leave you in confusion. And because of that faith that he will speak to you, Christ will definitely speak to you. Now, I'm talking about the voice of the indwelling Christ. Let us know first where Christ is. Then we will know how it is we hear his voice. Where is Christ today? That's an important question. Or you might feel... What, why, do we know, why do we need to know where he is? We need to know where Christ is today. Now we're told in the scriptures that when Christ arose from the dead, he appeared to his own disciples. And after he had appeared to his disciples, then he was taken off from them. And in Mark chapter 16, verse 19, so then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Christ went up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. What's he doing there? In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Christ is on the right hand side of God, making intercession for you. Making intercession so that you'll not make a mistake in the major decisions of your life. So that eventually you will make heaven your home. So that you'll be victorious in life. Now, in relation to the believer today, where is Christ? In Revelation Chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Every believer needs to understand that Christ is living on the inside of him, in your spirit, in your heart. When we were teaching little children, we taught them a chorus, into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay. And when Jesus comes into your heart at salvation, he comes in to stay. And greater is he that is in you 
than he that is out there in the world. And if he is there, then he will speak to you. He will guide you. Christ is the light, the light on your pathway. Christ is the one that will speak and guide and direct. As he lives within you, how does he act? Now we can come back to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 4. And when he put forth his own, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Let me remind you of something. The sheep does not make the shepherd to talk, to speak, to shout. The shepherd himself has enough love, enough concern for the sheep that the shepherd will speak to them. Many times we think, if I fast long, if I pray hard, if I shout aloud, then God will speak to me. No, not at all. It's not the sheep that makes the shepherd to speak. It is the love in the shepherd that makes the shepherd to speak, to direct, to guide the sheep. My praying only gets me prepared to hear his voice. My fasting only makes me prepared to hear distinctly and directly what he's telling me. And God definitely will lead his own. That's his promise. And the shepherd will not leave the sheep to go astray. He will speak. And he said, my sheep follow me and they know my voice. A stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of strangers. Look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now it's easy to read those verses and say, yes, I've read that before. But how do we know the voice of the shepherd? That's a great question. If you had grown up in a locality where you are very young, where they rear animals, you'll discover that the new animal that, that is brought into the flock will not know the voice of the shepherd, but will be mixing together with all the other animals. And when the shepherd speaks or calls out, those who have been there for a long time, they have been hearing that voice a long time, therefore they are used to that voice now, they follow. And then when that new sheep sees that all the others are going, then he goes. At another time again, that same voice will come. And then that new sheep, not totally new now, will hesitate, will look up, meditating and thinking, that seems like the voice that called us together yesterday. But that sheep will not walk. That sheep will remain just there. And then we'll see the others moving. Then the sheep will say and think, oh yes, I think I almost got it. And then we'll follow them. On the third day, that voice of the shepherd will call again. And that new sheep, not totally new now, immediately that sheep hears that and say, now I can recognize that. It's not only the old sheep that can recognize now. I know that now and will begin, will not even wait for the others, will now begin to walk in the direction of that, of that voice. That's how to know the voice of God. How did you know the voice of your mother? You have forgotten, I'll remind you. When you were born, you didn't know the difference between the voice of your mother and the nurse and the doctor and the maid. Everybody was alike to you. You see, when we are born again, many times we will not be able to differentiate. Is that my own mind? Is that the voice of the shepherd? Is that the voice of the devil? You know, they seem confusing. But then your mother, you know, will carry you, will talk to you will sing to you eventually because you have been hearing and hearing and hearing you can tell that's mommy and when your mother is coming from outside you have been playing before all of a sudden you hear that same voice you catch it no teacher taught you just by listening every day just by responding to that voice every day that's how you knew the voice of your parents how did you know the voice of the preacher you know, the newcomers, sometimes I see the newcomers. When somebody comes up here, being a man, they would uh, look at one another, pinch one another, and say, is that the pastor? The other people might say, I don't think so. Or maybe he is. Let's wait and watch. And then the person finishes all the things and then goes to sit down. And uh, they discuss among themselves. I see them. They say, maybe it's not the pastor.
They call the ushers, they say, is that the pastor? And then the, pa the, person, the usher will not even look back. Why doesn't the usher look back? The usher doesn't need to see me. The usher has been hearing that voice over and over. And uh, the usher might say yes or no without even looking back. And eventually, the newcomer now will come the next time again. And when he comes the next time, he's not totally new, but a little bit new. He might still ask, is that uh, the pastor? And the person sitting close by might say yes or no. After five weeks, once uh, I say, let us pray, he says, that's a pastor. That's how to know the voice of the shepherd. You know, at the first time, it seems a little bit confusing. Is that the shepherd? Is that Christ? Is that my savior? But you see, those things where you're asking, is that the shepherd? There are still minor, minor things in life. Should I do this? Should I do that? Eventually, you do that thing. Another time again, you hear the voice, is that the shepherd? Is that the savior? Again, the spirit of God will confirm in your heart. And eventually, after about three months, if you are following consistently, if you are meditating consistently, if you are listening to the shepherd all the time, you'll just say, yes, that's the voice of my savior. That's the voice of the shepherd. My brothers and sisters, that's how we know the voice of the shepherd. And I believe that as we continue to listen to him, he will guide us in Jesus' name. The voice of a stranger is very, very difficult to recognize. The voice of a stranger will bring confusion. It will bring doubt. It will bring darkness. And in your heart, there will be no settled peace. That's how we know that's a stranger talking. Why does the voice of the stranger bring confusion? Well, because the stranger doesn't love you. The stranger wants your life to be muddled up. He wants you to be confused. And the stranger will talk at a pace, at a rate, that you will not easily grasp because he wants to deceive and confuse. But the shepherd, he knows what language to use. He knows at what pace to go. And when you hear the voice of the shepherd, the Spirit of God will confirm within that that is the voice of your Savior. In Isaiah chapter 30, Verses 20 and 21. And though the Lord give you the bread of affliction, the bread of adversity, and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in age, when ye turn to the right, and when ye turn to the left. From what I've told you, you know that you need to consistently fellowship with the Lord. As you consistently fellowship with the Lord, you'll begin to realize the voice of the Lord, the voice of the shepherd. There's another area of God's guidance we need to think about and talk about. That's what I've written as spiritual intuitive perception. What we call intuition is that sometimes you just know something. Some people will say, it just occurred to me that you were visiting me this afternoon. And then they will, you know, if it happened to you at home before, you wake up in the morning. And if you're a wife at home, you tell your husband, it looks I'm just having this feeling. I don't know how it came. I just know that uncle so-and-so will visit us today. And the husband might say, you come again. You're always, uh, you know, saying some of these funny, funny things. Well, I don't know why, but I just woke up this morning and just knew that Uncle So-and-So will be visiting us today. And as you go during the day, the conviction becomes stronger in you. And uh, you are saying that, I, I don't know, but looks like Uncle So-and-So will come today. And about uh, 6 o'clock in the evening, somebody knocks at the door. And uh, you might even tell your husband, you know, I told you, that's uncle. And then you open, the, you say, welcome, we are expecting you. How are you expecting me? I didn't write a letter to you. When I woke up this morning, I just knew you'll be visiting us today. Has that ever happened before? Now, that's intuition. But if you're a Christian, that's spiritual, intuitive perception. You just know that you know, and you're very, very sure God guides that way. Now let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 4. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, Here am I. For thou callest me. 
And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again, the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. Look at what follows. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Eli did not see any vision. Eli did not hear any voice. Eli did not have any mighty thing taking place. But Samuel came the first time. Eli, you are calling me. No, I didn't call you. And Eli did not think about it. Go back and sleep. Again, he came. I heard you are calling me. It looks like your voice. No, I'm not calling you. Go back and sleep again. The third time, now you are calling me. All of a sudden, it struck Eli. That's the perception I'm talking about. He perceived that the Lord had called the child. You know, sometimes it will occur to you like that. That the Lord wants you to do something. Or the Lord is leading you to that brother. The Lord is leading you to that sister. And you will not perceive it originally. But all of a sudden, it just strikes you. It just comes upon you. And it just remains indelibly upon the canvas of your spirit. Upon the table of your heart. Like we used to say. And you just know, and you just perceive, that is the Lord leading me. That is the Lord attaching me to that individual or making me to say yes to that individual. That intuitive spiritual perception. Look at other instances in the scriptures. In Nehemiah chapter 6, looking at verse 10. Afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Meher, Tabiel, who was shut up, and he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come to slay thee. And I said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. The situation here is that they were making Nehemiah afraid. And as they were making him afraid, they came to him and they said, Now you must hide yourself. We must go into the temple and hide. Immediately that person came. He didn't hear a voice. He didn't see any vision. He just knew in his spirit, perception, that this person is a deceiver. He's not telling the truth. You know, sometimes it may be in your office, Somebody comes to you. Immediately he appears and he opens his mouth and says, Hello. All of a sudden you just knew in your spirit he wants to tell me a lie. You smile and then you say, What is it? And he begins to talk. Everything that he says, eventually when he finishes, you say, I don't believe that. That's not true. He said, How did you know? I just know. I just knew in my spirit. I just perceived. You are not telling me the truth. That thing is wrong. He said, Well, I felt I could just get this over you. That's true that you have said. It's not true. How did you know that? That that wasn't true. Who told you? You just had this intuitive perception within you. Now look at verse 12. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him. He knew in the spirit. He knew in the heart. And many times the Lord will make a person to perceive. Will make a person to know in the heart. That these people... Either they are false or they are right. In Luke chapter 20, verse 23. But he perceived their craftiness, and he said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Here is re where I have a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. These people came to him and they flattered, they flattered him. They said, we know that you fear no man. You are a teacher of the truth. Should we pay tribute to Caesar or not? All of a sudden, in his spirit, he perceived, in his own spirit, in his own heart, that they were wicked people. He perceived their craftiness. Look at Mark chapter 2. 
verse 8. And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit, this is an internal thing. All of a sudden, it just strikes you. You just know, all of a sudden, that's the will of God. That's the mind of God. I believe that's the revelation of God. You cannot explain. And when it comes on your heart like that, it's so certain, it's so sure, that it ties itself upon your heart. It's a type of conviction, a type of knowledge you cannot shake off. Look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 32. From verse 6. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Anamiel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field, that is, in Anathoth. For the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Anamiel, mine uncle's sons, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine, buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. Jeremiah had got a revelation before, but he was in doubt. He was wondering, is it so? Is it not so? And sometimes in marriage, you believe that you have the revelation of the Lord, but you are still wondering, is it so? Is it not so? And all of a sudden, somebody comes to you. Immediately that person comes to you, you just have the spiritual perception. Immediately this person came, just that time, I knew that this was the word of the Lord. Becomes very, very strong. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27. From verse 9. Now, when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them, and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with much hurt and much damage, not only of the lady and she, but also of our lives. No revelation, no direct voice, no thunder, no rain as yet. And it wasn't just a vision or a dream. They were about to sail. He just had that spiritual inward perception. He just knew, certainly within him. And he spoke out and he said, I've not got any revelation or dream this time, but I perceive, I can see it very, very clearly in my mind's eye that this will be with much hurt. Somebody may come to you for marriage and just as a person comes, you do not know his background or her background, you just perceive that this is not the way. That this will bring much hurt and much damage to my life. And you say, well, I'm sorry. I don't think this is the will of God. How do you know? You have not even prayed. How do you know? You have not even found out from the Lord. Just a spiritual, intuitive perception. And there are times like that when something will be deeply impressed upon your heart. Producing a deep conviction that you cannot shake off. This relates to another thing, point three, the inner witness of the Spirit. Let's remember again that the Spirit of God dwells in the believer. And that Spirit of God, Jesus Christ has told us he will guide us into all truth. Let's read that passage again, John chapter 16. John chapter 16 verse 13. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, he shall, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, from verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man. The things which God has prepared for them that love him. You may want to underline the word things, plural. Many, many things. Marriage included. Other things in your life included. Many things that God has prepared for you that your eyes have not seen. That your ears have not heard. 
that has not even entered into your heart until this time. But then how will you know those things? How will they be revealed unto you? Verse 10. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And the Spirit of God in you will speak within you, will make you to know that this is what he wants you to do. This is the step he wants you to take. It's very, very simple if you have been following the Lord. And if you have been following the Lord in those little details and areas of your life, it will not be difficult to know when he begins to guide and he witnesses internally in your spirit. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, from verse 19. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Peter had not seen any of those three men, but internally within him, we say internally because all the other people in the yard, in the house, they did not hear the voice of the Spirit. They did not hear three men seek thee, just inside him, on the inside. If you have been following the Lord intimately, there are times so we'll say, something said within me. I told you the testimony of the Methodist preacher some time ago, that this man had been laid, but the wife had come to the meeting I was holding at Calabar, and uh, had, had prayed on the handkerchief. And then the woman went back and tied the handkerchief on the neck of the man. And on the first day, nothing occurred to him. On the second day, nothing occurred to him. But on the third day, while they were carrying him, because he couldn't walk at all, totally paralyzed from the waist or downwards, he said something spoke within him that they should put him down. And he responded to that voice that spoke, that's internal witness of the Spirit, saying, your healing has come. The time has come. You are going to get the miracle now. That's the internal thing in the Spirit. And then they put him down. And that thing said within him, rise up. He obeyed that voice on the inside and rose up. And the voice said, begin to jump. He began to jump. That's how he got healed. The voice of the spirit within. And many times you will hear that inner voice of the spirit. And for Peter it said, behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them doubting nothing for I have sent them. And sometimes in marriage, when the person has call is coming, even before the person comes, if they just say, well, now somebody needs your attention. And you have not been thinking about marriage. You have not been thinking somebody is going to talk to me about marriage. But immediately they said, somebody needs your attention. All of a sudden, something speaks within you. They are going to talk about marriage. And then that thing continues within you and says, do not be stubborn. Just follow the leading of the Lord. Open up. You have been praying. Your answer is coming, and you will, you will wonder. And it's so clear within you, within your spirit and within your heart, that's the inner witness of the Spirit of God. And then it says, Then Peter went down to the men that were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And then he discussed about it. Proverbs chapter 20. Verse 27, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. That means whenever God bears witness in your heart through the spirit, it will bear witness through your own spirit, internally. It's on the inside you will hear that voice. Today we have dealt with part of the instances of knowing the voice of the Lord, the voice of the shepherd. The direction of the Lord, spiritual guidance. Remember, you need to believe that God will guide. If you are a child of God, he will not leave you in darkness. God will guide you. And anywhere with Jesus, you can safely go. Wherever the Lord is guiding you, he will not guide you into error. He will not guide you into bondage. He will not guide you into uncleanness. The Lord will guide you in paths of righteousness. And the guidance of the Lord will not destroy your life. The guidance of the Lord will be something that will be beneficial in your life. Let's rise up and pray. Next Monday, we'll finish up on the outline.
take to the Lord what you have learned today. Open up your spirit to the Lord, that the Lord will guide you. God loves you. His guidance is simple, not complicated. Trust Him. If Christ is living within you, He'll speak to you. Sometimes the Lord will drop that information in your spirit. You will perceive it intuitively. You will just know that you know. Believe God. He will not leave his own in confusion and darkness. Trust in the Lord, expecting that he will guide.